When I heard Apple was making a Godzilla TV show, I was like... I don't know why I put that in there, I just thought it was hilarious. Monarch Legacy of Monsters is another entry into the Warner Brothers MonsterVerse, which features films such as 2014's Godzilla, Kong Skull Island, and Kong vs. Godzilla. I wasn't expecting too much from the first two episodes, but I gotta say, it's been kind of fun. So I thought I'd put together this video of the biggest theories and questions out there. I've also left timestamps below so you can see all the topics I'll be covering. But before we begin, make sure to like and subscribe. I'm playing planning on covering the entire season. Bridging the gap between our flashbacks in the 1950s and 1973 is Bill Randa. Whether you believe these two are 21 years apart, well, I'll leave that up to you. If you've seen Skull Island, you'll know that it was Bill Randa who convinced U.S. Senator Al Willis to fund an expedition there. This was an attempt to prove his hollow earth theory, that a sort of world within a world exists home to the titans. We saw this world in Godzilla vs. Kong. Bill Randa will meet his demise on Skull Island, but not before throwing this mysterious bag into the ocean. We'll see the side emblazoned with his name, William Randa, and the Monarch logo. It's implied that the bag remained at sea for 40 years until it was picked up by a Japanese fishing trawler in 2013. How it got from the trawler to Hiroshi Randa's hidden safe is a mystery yet to be solved, but I have a sneaking suspicion Kate's dad, who has the answer to this question, isn't dead. In fact, it was his death that brought Kate to Japan. She's here to settle some of his affairs after it was revealed his plane went down in Alaska and the wreckage never found. It's in Japan where she discovers her father lived a double life, complete with a different wife and son. But more on that later. Bill worked for Monarch, an organization founded in 1946 to study MUTOs, or Massive Unidentified Terrestrial Organisms. It's this group that Kate sees taking pictures of Godzilla on G-Day, an event depicted in 2014's Godzilla. With Tim, a Monarch employee, hell-bent on retrieving these files, it seems the mystery behind Monarch and what it wants will be one of the series' biggest questions. Inside the bag are a half-dozen data storage tapes. It's old technology, but with the help of Kentaro's friend May, they're able to decipher these encrypted tapes. We'll see a slew of classified and redacted Monarch memos, but upon opening them, it's triggered a Monarch recognition code in informing Monarch that it's been opened. We'll meet this woman named Collins who works in data culling. She's the one who informs Tim of the breach. But what I found more interesting was this giant wall where she works. It almost looks like a subway map, but obviously these guys aren't working for public transit. I wonder if these are the movements of different MUDOs, or perhaps underground networks MUDOs use to travel. On one of the tapes, they'll find this map, which has similar lines like those found on the wall. It looks like that big satellite map in his office. According to Kentaro, he and Kate's father, Hiroshi, made software for satellites. Maybe Monarch used Hiroshi's satellite software to track these MUDOs. After all, Kate said that the Monarch soldiers on G-Day acted as if they were expecting Godzilla's arrival. Collins here asks Tim if he wants to, quote, kick this up to Verdugo, who we can assume is his boss, but for some reason he he wants to keep this potentially catastrophic leak from her. It could mean that Tim might have ulterior motives when it comes to grabbing these files. The first of two major flashbacks is set in 1952 Philippines. Lee Shaw has been tasked with escorting Dr. Keiko Mura as she investigates strange readings of airborne radioisotopes. Now these isotopes aren't from nuclear bombs, but originate from the island itself. While trashing his father's office, Kentaro finds a film canister marked Phil Philippines 52. Knowing that Bill Randa had a film camera during that time, it's likely footage of their time there. We also learn that Keiko's radiation chart and Bill's map of locals identifying a mysterious dragon match up. This radiation might be what Lee saw. This is most likely the result of the dragon-like Muto they meet who's made its home in the USS Lawton, the same ship Bill Randa was stationed on in 1943 when he was a part of the US Navy. It's first in Kong Skull Island that we learn Bill was the only survivor of this Mudo attack on the Lawton. You heard of the USS Lawton? Neither did the public.
an attack which the US military claimed was the result of a Japanese sub. It's what spurred Bill's research, wanting to prove to humanity that these monsters exist. We'll see this picture of the destroyed Lawton in Skull Island, but it's never mentioned how it made its way to the jungles of the Philippines. Perhaps in this show they're claiming this ship was taken by the Muto and dropped here as a feeding ground or macabre reproductive ritual. We'll see men who've died over nine years ago with their bodies seemingly preserved. The second major flashback happens in Kazakhstan 1959. This is seven years after Keiko, Lisha, and Bill had their encounter with the Muto on the USS Lawton. Since then, Keiko and Bill have developed a romantic relationship. They're most likely married as we see both characters wear wedding rings. They've come to continue their research, attempting to prove that a vast underground network of tunnels connect under the Earth's surface. A local kid has a frightening tale that the communist government burned a hole deep into the Earth's crust, which may have opened a way for the Mudos to come up top. Now, this place is supposed to be off limits due to radiation. We'll see this Chernobyl like nuclear plant, but when Keiko checks her Geiger counter for radiation, every time there's a spike, it fades away as if being absorbed. These insectoid type eggs feed feed off the radiation, and as luck would have it, as soon as they arrive to gather a sample, they break from their shells and attack. This is where Keiko dies, but since she falls into this crevice, we can't say with 100% certainty she's truly gone. According to Kentaro, Hiroshi's mother, who is Keiko, died when he was young, so it's possible that he was just a baby or child when his parents were in Kazakhstan. In episode 2, Lee Smith says that Hiroshi Randa didn't just disappear without a trace. This goes against what the Alaskan police said, who claimed his bush plane went down during a storm, but oddly enough, no wreckage was ever found. When Tim finds out that Kentaro is the son of Hiroshi, he knows it's not a good sign, so whatever Hiroshi was planning seems to be counter to Monarch. Kentaro even claims that whatever his father was up to might explain why he had two families. He had some reason for doing what he did. I thought it was pretty great to have Kurt Russell and his son Wyatt play both the young and old versions of Lee Smith. A lot must have certainly happened between 1959, the last time we see young Lee, and 2015, the first time we see old Lee. When the gang find him at an old folks home run by Monarch, which is secretly a pseudo prison to keep tabs on him, he's more than ready to join them on a mission to find their father. And I actually found this to be a bit of a red flag, like this guy has probably been here for years years and immediately cuts off his ankle monitor and is like, you son of a bitch, I'm in. What I'm trying to say is that I'm keeping an eye on him in case he's secretly working for Monarch in an attempt to get them to lead them to Hiroshi, who seems to hold the keys on the mysteries that are going on here. An interesting world building scene I enjoyed was the plane being decontaminated. Since Mudos are attracted to radiation, this may be the government's way of preventing another attack. But as the passenger beside Kate says, it merely creates the illusion of safety. Now it's time to get into the trailer sleuthing section where we go over the season's trailers for clues on where the show is headed. Keep in mind I won't be covering every shot, just the ones that pertain to the story ahead. Here we see some old film footage and Lee watching it. As we'll see throughout the trailers, I get the feeling Lee and Keiko might have hooked up. This discovery may have been what caused Hiroshi to become estranged from Lee, who became like this uncle slash surrogate father to him after after his father's death. This quick shot of Keiko and Lee dancing leads me to believe this even more so. More film footage which appears to show military officers and some Godzilla spikes. Hiroshi is alive, unless this is some sort of flashback. Check out the weird looking ball device in the background. It looks a bit similar to the device Shaw and a group of others get into here with the Monarch logo. I totally get astronaut vibes here, but instead of space, my guess is they're making their way to the hologram the home of the Titans we saw in Godzilla vs. Kong. In the behind-the-scenes trailer, we see yet another one of these balls sometime in the 1950s. Lee says in voiceover that he wanted Monarch to be an organization that protected both humanity and the Titans, so him being on the outs with them would suggest Monarch may have deviated from that original plan. We'll see two big locations featured in these trailers, one a desert and another someplace super cold. Alaska was mentioned as being 
being the place Hiroshi's plane went down, so maybe that's where this is. Both the desert and arctic locations are home to titans, this new one and Godzilla. We'll see Kentaro tape this piece of paper with holes in it which reflects spots of light on what looks to be his father's map, or something similar to it. Whether this is a constellation or something else entirely is yet to be known. They point to specific coordinates, and if you look up the one here, it corresponds to Kandasa, Algeria. Somewhere up north, we see these Aurora Borealis type lights emanating from below. It kind of reminds me of the same lights Lee saw in the Philippines back in 52. We'll see his reaction to it as well. The gang ends up making their way to Monarch headquarters, so it'll be interesting to see how these two forces come together. That's about it for episodes one and two of Monarch. Now I turn it over to you. What are your thoughts and theories for the upcoming season? I want to hear them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And for more Mad Takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, let them fight.